From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Good Friday morning. It's 530. Welcome to Montana This Morning on Victoria Hill. Thank you so much for kicking off the day and the weekend with us. Miller is here to tell us uh, what we can expect for this big holiday weekend. Well, three-day weekend for lots of people. Yeah, if you got outdoor plans, it's going to be good for it. You know, uh, it's going to get hot Sunday and Monday, though, so you want to keep yourself hydrated and the sunscreen. We do anticipate a lot of sunshine today, though. I think we're going to have our coolest day of the week. We may not get out of the 60s for a good portion of the viewing area. Nice shot there of downtown Billings, courtesy of the Stockman Bank weather cam. 53 at the airport, humidity at 55%, winds out of the north at about 9 miles an hour. We see we do have a, uh, some moisture. We have this little low that came out from the south last night and um, southwest, and it's uh, pumping some of that moisture in. And we have this broad trough that's dropping in through the area today. So you combine that, giving us a chance of rain, mainly this morning, and it will move off to the east as we go along this afternoon. Cold strip, we're seeing some rain right, right now. You're sitting at 54. Uh, we actually have some snow in the higher elevations of the Bear Tooth right now. And we've got 50 at Clark, 43 in Gardner, up to White Sulphur Springs at 44, Ingomar at 54. So highs today in the 60s and 70s. You can see that rain does move out as we go along this afternoon. We're gonna go with a high of 69 today. Here in Billings, we start off in the 50s. We do have a chance to see some of that rain this morning. Actually got a few sprinkles as I came in this morning, but I think later on like 9, 10, maybe 11 o'clock, a better chance we could see some of that rain, especially eastern parts of Yellowstone County. And then the sunshine will return a little bit later on this afternoon, turning out to be a very nice day. Light surface smoke, the air quality is still gonna be fair. Unfortunately, we're going to start to see those winds shift in from the west across the weekend. So the air quality for Saturday, Sunday and Monday is going to be poor. So you have to keep that in mind if you have uh, respiratory ailments. You might want to limit your time outdoors if you can. All right. Well, I do enjoy when it rains during the day. I feel like it rains at night a lot. And so when we, and we miss it, see, yeah, we miss asleep, it. Yeah. yeah. And so when we get to see the rain falling, it's always a pleasant experience. But yeah, I did feel those sprinkles when I um, was heading into work this morning and I was like, sprinkles or bird flying overhead? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> it was sprinkles because then I got in my car and there was some raindrops on my You didn't do this, go. <laughs> no, I did not. That. No, that's rain. I was that's like, rain. but then at the same that's time, rain. it'd be my luck at this rate for it to be a bird flying overhead. <laughs> so, what goes on in this mind? Scary sometimes. Mm, well, Very amusing. <laughs> All right, now you can go have breakfast. Thank you. You're welcome, Miller. Right. I'll get to news. Well, we begin with the sad news this morning. A person was struck and killed by a hit and run driver while crossing a central billing street. It happened just before nine o'clock last night at the intersection of Central Avenue and Santa Fe Drive. A pickup was heading west when it struck the pedestrian, then fled. Police say the vehicle was quickly tracked down and the suspect was taken into custody. The victim died at the scene. Information about the victim and the driver have not been released. Montana's unemployment rate is looking good, now sitting at 3.6%. There were more than 3,300 jobs added in July. 2,900 of those were in the food service industry. Some of the Montanans who return to work are taking advantage of a program from Governor Greg Gianforte that gives $1,200 to people who re-enter the workforce after losing their job during the pandemic. So far, more than 3,000 applications have been submitted. Over 500 people have already been approved and more than 300 were denied. An applicant needs to be employed for at least four weeks to be eligible for the money. 2,400 applications have not yet met that requirement. Yellowstone County has submitted the most applications at 420, but Gallatin County has the greatest number of bonuses paid out with workers getting a combined $93,000. In all, Montanans have received a total of $600,000 from the program. Sponsors of a proposed constitutional initiative to cap property taxes in Montana have revised it to focus only on primary residences. The sponsors note they want the tax benefits focused on Montana families rather than out-of-staters buying vacation homes. If passed, the constitutional initiative would limit property taxes to 1% of a residential property's 2019 assessed value. That value could increase only if the property is sold to a new owner when its value would then become the sale price. The proposed constitutional initiative must undergo legal review before backers can start gathering signatures to get it on the 2022 ballot. It would need the signatures of more than 60,000 registered voters.
To the latest now on the pandemic, more than 200,000 pediatric COVID-19 cases were reported nationwide last week. That is five times higher than in July. CDC officials report in August the rate of hospitalizations for children was nearly four times higher in states with the lowest overall vaccination coverage. Meanwhile, ahead of the Labor Day weekend, the CDC is warning people about hitting the road. It says unvaccinated people should stay home. AAA is still expecting a busy travel weekend nationwide, saying recent travel bookings are up 11% over pre-pandemic levels. A new study shows people who get vaccinated are significantly less likely to get long COVID. Researchers found that 5% of fully vaccinated people who tested positive for COVID-19 later got long COVID. That number was 11% for those who were not fully vaccinated. A new study shows most Americans 16 and older have some level of immunity to the virus. The CDC says about twice as many people have been infected with COVID-19 than have been officially counted. The agency worked with 17 blood collection organizations in every state to gather the information. The CDC says immunosuppressed people who are fully vaccinated account for up to 44% of breakthrough infections requiring hospitalizations. It's why the FDA authorized a third dose for them. There are studies underway to determine just how much protection that booster may provide. But reporter Ashar Qureshi found that for millions, it may take more than an additional dose to give them peace of mind. For most people who were vaccinated against COVID-19, the jab meant relief and some semblance of protection against the deadly virus. I was so excited. I really felt that all I needed to do was get a vaccine and uh, that life would be good. But Barbara Creed, a double lung transplant recipient, is among the 3% of adults who are immunocompromised. Statistically, she has an 82-fold higher chance of a breakthrough COVID infection and is 485 times more likely to have an infection that would lead to hospitalization or even death. She got her third Pfizer dose just a few weeks ago. I got the Pfizer all three times. Um, I know they get a good response in people uh, who are not immunocompromised. But the only question is what it's like for us. Among some severely immunocompromised people like solid organ transplant recipients, cancer patients, those with HIV, and people who take immunosuppressant drugs, the CDC says there was virtually no protection after two doses. The Johns Hopkins data was finding that about 20-25% of their patients were responding after a second dose, but that left a large group of individuals who were not responding. A small study in Israel preliminarily found that twice as many organ transplant recipients developed antibodies after a third dose compared to those who only had two. And a Canadian study of third doses in transplant recipients found additional protection. They were able to uh, get a, an immune response or antibody response with an additional dose of the vaccine to an additional 30 percent of patients. So getting us to, you know, 50%. Most physicians like Creed's are advising against an antibody test post third dose because it may provide a false sense of security. Dr. Angaroni points out the Delta variant and breakthrough cases have proven that even with an antibody response, an infection can occur. I think the using the antibody test as a risk assessment tool or a risk uh, divining rod is not the appropriate rate, way to use the antibody. More important, he says, is to ensure that they surround themselves with people who are fully vaccinated. I think we still have to rely on those with working and healthy immune systems to protect those that have a compromised immune system. For Barbara Creed, it's about peace of mind rather than absolute certainty. I possibly have more protection. Of course, I don't know that. But it's a good feeling to know that there was a, a booster out there and that I was able to get it. I'm Usher Qureshi reporting. And now in other news, the death toll from Ida continues to rise. More than four dozen deaths have been confirmed along a roughly 1,300-mile path stretching from the Gulf Coast to New England. Here's Bradley Blackburn with the latest on the storm. Much of the northeastern U.S. is cleaning up after getting walloped by the remnants of Hurricane Ida. We saw a horrifying storm last night, unlike anything we have seen before. The storm dumped upwards of 10 inches of rain on parts of New York, New Jersey and Connecticut on Wednesday night and Thursday morning. More than half a foot fell in a matter of hours. It's not waves off the ocean or the sound. It is flash floods coming from the sky. It was literally Niagara Falls here. 
In New York City, roads are still a mess. There are lines of washed out cars along the highways. The heavy rains caught many off guards and it trapped some drivers. A Connecticut state trooper died when his police cruiser was swept away by water. Others drowned at home when water inundated basement apartments. This is one of the most difficult storms that I've seen in my 30 years since Hurricane Sandy. Twisters touched down in Maryland and in New Jersey, prompting the National Weather Service to issue its first ever tornado emergency for the Northeast. Last night, President Biden declared federal disasters in New York and New Jersey. That clears the way for FEMA to assist in the recovery and cleanup efforts. Hurricane Ida didn't care if you were a Democrat or a Republican rural or urban. This destruction is everywhere. The president will travel to Louisiana today to get a first-hand look at the damage the storm caused when it made landfall there on Sunday. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News. On the East Coast, more than 100,000 were left in the dark, but in Louisiana, nearly a million homes and businesses are still without power. And you can help the people of Louisiana and at the same time support a local restaurant. Cajun Fatties in Billings is raising money for the Cajun Navy, a volunteer group that assists with search and rescue efforts. The owners of the restaurant is also working to get food, water, and fuel down south. She's a Louisiana native, so for her, seeing the devastation hits home. My grandbabies are out there in the Baton Rouge area, um, born and raised there, and uh, it's important, you know, it's important for us all to come together wherever you live, wherever you are, and try to help out your, 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 favor, uh, your neighbors, but for me it's a little bit closer. My babies are down there, and you know, the rest of our family lives there, and, um, and so we want to help. I mean, these guys are really in, they're really in trouble right now, so that's important. If you would like to donate, you can head to Cajun Fatty's Facebook page or stop by the restaurant and have a meal. Over in western Montana, nearly 100 people will lose their job on Monday after the owners of a St. Regis sawmill announced their ending operations. The Idaho Forest Group, the company that runs the mill, blames a declining lumber market as the reason for the shutdown. Employees say they were completely blindsided by the announcement. Governor Gianforte's office weighed in, saying the governor was surprised to hear about the mill closing and feels for the community of St. Regis. It's a community some fear may never be the same. We were just starting to get a more stable uh, school population with people moving here, uh, getting jobs at the mill and, and having young families again. And uh, I think that a good part of that is going to go away. A company spokesman said in a statement, we do not arrive, we did not arrive at this decision easily or lightly, and we recognize the very real and human consequences for our employees and the community. The sawmill employed 99 people. The population of St. Regis is just 210. Some scary moments in Missoula. Three students were detained as Hellgate High School went into lockdown over a potential firearm threat. It happened yesterday afternoon. The school's principal says one student told another they had a gun and they planned to use it. That prompted a 90-minute lockdown. Hellgate's principal says officers were on scene in two minutes and used the school's surveillance cameras to identify the suspects. One freshman says it was a scary experience, especially on her third day of high school. Well, I was in building trades and we went to lockdown and we had to all get against the wall and we shoved tables in front of the um, classroom doors and we all sat and just stayed quiet for about 30 minutes. My first thought was to text my mom and I tell, told her what happened and my dad checked with me and I just stayed calm because I knew that was the best thing to do. Police say the parents of the three students they detained have been contacted and they will continue to investigate. Relatives of the victims of the September 11th attacks are calling on the Justice Department's Inspector General to investigate why the FBI has not released certain pieces of evidence related to the origin of the attack. One of those family members says he doesn't want politicians commemorating the 20th anniversary next weekend unless top secret files related to that day finally get released. Reporter Joe St. George has more on why there's still secrecy after all these years. Here's a beam from the South Tower and it's a memorial garden with my uh, dad's name on it. For Brett Eagleson, this place in Middletown, Connecticut, has always been a bit more than just a memorial. Unfortunately, since we never recovered my dad, this is, this is what we have to honor him. His father, Bruce, was killed during the September 11th attacks 20 years ago when Brett 
was just a teenager. These memorials all over America signify 9-11 affected all of us. But as the country prepares to commemorate 20 years since that fateful day, Brett doesn't want the date to be exclusively about the past. This is a story about how angry we are. Okay, we've done this 19 times and the families have had it. We're done with the emotional side. We want our government to finally help us. Brett is demanding President Biden release secret files associated with that day. Operation Encore was an investigation by the FBI following the 9-11 Commission. It looked into the possibility of unproven allegations of Saudi Arabia's role in the attacks. Most of the files are currently sealed. Brett says he just wants to know more about that day and the event that killed his dad. If my dad was gunned down in the streets of New York City, I would be able to walk into the local police precinct, sit down with the detective, and work with him and see all the files that existed. As September 11th approaches, Brett says he and others know this is their moment. When then-candidate Joe Biden was running for office, he wrote this letter to attorneys representing 9-11 families in an ongoing lawsuit saying the 9-11 families are right to seek full truth and accountability. But so far as president, he's only released a statement that Brett says guarantees nothing. It's because all the statement ended up saying was, is that we will consider reconsidering what we can and can't give to you. But releasing classified government documents isn't easy, and it doesn't happen just like that. I was a diplomat. Brett Bruin is with Global Situation Room and has worked on national security issues. He says when the government declassifies something, it usually involves every top government official having the opportunity to say no. A whole host of acronyms across Washington get to decide whether or not releasing that information will somehow negatively affect their work. Bruin speculates that whatever is in this file, it has the potential to impact U.S.-Saudi relations, and that's why it's been secret for so long. We have a relationship with Saudi Arabia that's very complex. We depend on them for a lot of our energy resources. We depend on them for support on terrorism. Saudi Arabia's leaders have consistently denied any connection to 9-11. But Brett says the fact 15 of the 19 terrorists from that day were from that country has piqued his curiosity for years, knowing more would help with the grief. Bring us the closure that we deserve. I'm Joe St. George reporting. And before we take a break, a lawsuit against Apple and its voice assistant will proceed. A judge ruled in favor of a plaintiff's claim that Siri possibly violates a user's privacy. The ruling states Siri violated the privacy of plaintiffs by accidental ac activations when they did not expect or intend for the device to be listening to their conversations. However, the judge ruled against their claim they suffered any economic harm. Apple did not comment on the ruling. Thank you so much for starting your Friday with us here in Montana this morning.